103.9 FM, WOZO Radio, Knoxville. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Hello and welcome to Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio, 103.9 LPFM, right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Today is Sunday, July 19th, 2020. I'm Larry Rhodes, or Doubter 5. And as usual, we have our co-host, Wombat, on the phone with us. Hello, Wombat. God is so good. I, I, I think that's as far as I got in that song. <laughs> and we're all grateful. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> and our guests are. today are Dread Pirate Higgs, uh, Red Leader, and George. Say hello, everybody. Ahoy. Hi. Digital Free Thought Radio Hour is a talk radio show about atheism, free thought, rational thought, humanism, and the sciences. And conversely, we'll also talk about religion, religious faiths, gods, holy books, and superstition. And if you get the feeling that you're the only non-believer in Knoxville, well, you're just not. There are several atheist, free-thinking, and rationalist groups that exist right here in Knoxville, and we'll be telling you how you can connect with them right after the mid-show break. Um, did you know that there was an atheist call-in TV show broadcasting right here in Knoxville? It has been for over 10 years. Did you know that one, Bat? Yes, and I downloaded it, uh, let's see, Friday, and I've been playing it all this weekend. I can tell you it's a really playing great combination it. between Animal Crossing, Pokemon, and maybe Stardew okay, Valley. Stop it. You, you, you go around, <laughs> and, I know, it's crazy, right? It's addicting as, 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 as heck. Let but he wants you to stop him. I just go around and I pick up ooblets, which are like mm. these tiny little animals, and you no, can have them grow no, crops no. in your field. And you Stop him, Larry. It's really amazing. It's really cool. One of these so days I highly you'll recommend, find it. Highly recommend you check it out. Nope. Nope. Not it. It's not a game. It's just a show. And that matter of fact, this was on TV, uh, Community Access TV, for 10 years in Knoxville. But just this year, switched over to video streaming so you can find it on YouTube. And we'll tell you more about that after the mid-show break. Cool. Uh, if you'd like to interact with us during the show, you can go to Facebook and ser- search for Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Uh, we have a page there and, and use the messaging function to send us questions or comments. Uh, Wombat, we're going to be talking about intelligence and how you define it. Is that correct? Yeah, I want to go all through about intelligence, <clears throat> our religion. If if you are, uh, is it possible to be intelligent and religious? Are you any more intelligent if you're not religious? And we'll we'll pick on IQ for a little bit. But before we go into all that, I take it up to our own venerable Dread Pirate Higgs for invocation. There once was a church with a creed that claimed I would have no more need, but they came to implore. I give bucks at the door. Then my pockets were empty indeed. <laughs> Ramen. Oh, Ramen. <laughs> Bad. Okay, okay. Good truth. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about intelligence today. Uh, it was something that I've been hankering in my mind since we were talking about knowledge last week. And I figured before we dive deep into what intelligence is, let's talk about what we think intelligence is. We'll do a quick round table. George, I know you like defining things. How about you start us off? What do you think intelligence is? Well, I don't have an answer for that, of course. Yes, I do <laughs> like defining things because mm. I've done that for a living. And oh, um, whoa. It gets everybody on the same page, and we know what we're talking about when we give a definition right up at the top, and that's why I often remark about that. Uh, I think we we sometimes assume that other people know what we're talking about when we don't. Um, First of all, I want to ask, uh, I want to comment on something that just popped into my mind which is this there are different types of intelligence interesting well give me one give me one definition of one type just let me okay have my um, uh, let me think for a moment don't worry physical it's just live radio <laughs> f- f- physical physical intelligence physical intelligence can intelligence. be manifested by a mechanic And you watch the guy working with his hands on your car, and you realize that he has what I call intelligent hands. So he's capable. Oh, yes. 
Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. Red Leader, I'm going to throw this out to you. HowJesusDidIt.com, representing here. Uh, intelligence. You have this very intelligent, thoughtful pose going on right now. How would you, what would you say intelligence is? What would you expect to see if we looked it up in the dictionary? I'm, I'm at a loss. I, I have no idea what, uh, what to comment about this. Um, I, I'm, I'm totally at a loss. You know, I feel I feel like uh, a Christian would be, ha- be happy to tell you, like, hey, all these guys don't don't know. I'll be happy to step in and tell you, like, but maybe maybe I can throw something out here. If it's, is intelligence just knowing a lot of stuff? What do you think about that, Red Leader? Do you, do you think intelligence? Is I, just I don't knowing know. A lot I, of stuff? I've seen I've seen intelligence in dogs and animals and octopuses. Mm-hmm. Uh, if when you're talking about accomplishing a task, a problem. Then okay. we see it in lower animals, and and uh, as far as intelligence in humans, I I don't know. Oh, Larry, I don't really have a definition for it. Well, for, adding to what Dale said, uh, Red Leader said that uh, accomplishing uh, solving problems, I think, uh, solving anywhere from a simple to complex problems, uh, the higher intelligence, the more complex problems that you can uh, address and solve. Okay, now we're getting somewhere good because I like that. I like that. I like that as definition. It's not just being able to do something, but it's being able to take a problem and make it not a problem anymore, like resolving situations. And the more complex the problem, the more intelligent, or and you, the more complex the problem that was resolved, the more intelligent that person must be, or animal, or whatever. That seems to be a really good marker. Gary, can you add to that? Well, I, I would agree. Um, it's the capacity uh, for solving problems with uh, information that you uh, put together in novel, novel ways. Okay. So it, it's, it's, not, it's not what you know. I mean, if everyone has access to the same information, yeah. intelligence is how well somebody could use that right. information to solve a problem or create a new novel um, situation or idea. But couldn't like you say that uh, having a, gra- a vast amount of knowledge at your fingertips or in your, uh, accessible through your memory would help you solve more imp- uh, complex problems um, so that, that could also add to the um, Yeah, uh, but I mean, someone ability. with higher intelligence may be more inclined to learn more. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's where I think some people conflate smarts with intelligence. No, okay. Those with two things are, are pretty distinct. Mm-hmm. I'd also wonder about access to information, not necessarily being intelligence, because I'm walking around with a smartphone that has access to all the internet, Wikipedia, all of mankind's scientific documents, music, yeah. art, all on one you know, rectangular device. That doesn't make me any more intelligent in a sense, because almost everyone Absolutely. has that same level of access. It's how I and use you, that information, right? Exactly. And, and, and that's, I mean, that's the kind of thing you see all over the internet is just how the, the assumption that yeah. you have all this access to information makes you smarter, mm. it doesn't. You can still be <laughs> dumb as a post and use all this information incorrectly. Right, right, right. A lot right, of it right. depends, a lot of it look depends at, on how much guy, how you have that incorporated in yourself. in the atmosphere. Where are you all talking at once? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. It, it, what I'm saying is a lot of it depends on how much of that information or knowledge you've incorporated into your own self uh, that you have instant access to when you're actually doing problem solving. If you, if you have a phone and you access the internet, you only have access to the things that you know about and mm. can, and can find or search mm. for. But if you've, uh, if you, let's say that you've gone in college, got a doctorate and, uh, and done 20 years of research, you have an awful lot of more knowledge at your disposal uh, to solve the problems that are that are uh, facing you at any particular time and you would may not even know where to look on the phone for information to solve. I'm not saying it doesn't help but I would think like if you can if you have a phone and you have the PhD and you still can't solve this problem and it's a really simple problem that might be a sign that like as George was alluding to you may not have intelligence in that area and maybe it's a bit better to like seek out an expert in that particular field. Being intelligent enough to ask for help when you need it is also, in my opinion, like an empathetic sign of intelligence, like emotional intelligence. But I I was going to Dredd. Dredd, what were you saying about like someone launching into space? Well, yeah, like I said, you know, uh, there was that flat earther who who died um, launching himself uh, to prove that the earth was flat. Oh no, Um, what, is this real? 
Yeah, yeah, no, he died. He, his parachute uh, failed or deployed as the rocket launched. He <laughs> built the rocket himself. So, oh no, you know, I guess he's he's clever enough to do that. Um, but uh, clearly, you know, abuse of uh, information available on the internet doesn't always render success. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think, uh, Red Leader, I'm going to throw this out at you. Does having access to the internet make you any more intelligent? Say your internet goes out, do you become any less intelligent as a person? If you have internet, do you get more smarter? How does it work? What do you think? I'd say if you have a question in your mind, you can uh, get it answered a lot quicker if you have a phone. Hmm. Okay. So, like, access to information does help. Um, I think we're all on the same page there, right? Yeah, I believe that an intelligent person, though, I had one friend that when the internet first started getting popular, he would go in there and just wander around looking at all different, and I said, well, what, what was your purpose for getting on the, on the internet? He goes, just to look around. In other words, he had no real reason. There was nothing he was going to look for. I imagine that if a person's using the internet as a tool, they would have the question in their mind, and then they would go research it. Hmm. Uh, that's it just seems like another source of information like the encyclopedia or any other area. Dred, what do you got? Well, I, I was just thinking that, um, you know, if, uh, oh, geez, I, I completely lost it. Sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. I was, I was thinking, back. how do you apply this to say an all powerful, all knowledge, all intelligent being, right? Like say you have a God, it doesn't have to be the Christian God, but, how do you assess, if we can assess intelligence by offering a problem that needs to be resolved and at varying levels of complexity and seeing what's the capstone of complexity of a problem that can be resolved and saying, okay, because you clear this, you're this intelligent. Um, if the problem is for at least, and I, I'm sorry for going back into the Christian model, but like, I need to figure, I need to figure out who my worst, my true followers are and who my true followers aren't. So I'm going to set up a system where I make a world and, and just put a book, you know, around the stone age or uh, bronze age and with a couple of sheep herders and we'll just see what happens. <laughs> and I'll wait a couple of There's not just one book. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> there's 10,000 books. Yeah. 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 And, and you have to consider the canon. So this applies even to like Muslim faith as well. Uh, there is the idea of jinn or demons or Satan, you know, people, supernatural forces that are capable of telling lies or convincing people who might mean well that they actually believe something that may not actually be true, like uh, demons that can fool with people's minds. And if those are in play, what isn't questionable at this point? Like, what can you take 100% confidently? Can I believe in God with 100% confidence, knowing that there's also Satan who is whose job is to convince people of things that may not necessarily be true. Like it's very hard to take things like that with absolute level of confidence. Hey, we got phones. We're, we'll edit this out, but George, make sure you mute yourself if you can. Um, Larry, we have yeah. this thing called, we have these things called demons. We have these things called Satan. Uh, well, we may, we, I don't think, I, I'm not convinced that we do, but how can you believe well, in God a hundred percent seriously? I don't believe that we have him, of course, but if, if like Christians believe that Satan is real yeah. and he has, he has uh, the ability to create illusions and, and create miracles and do magic, what chance yeah. do we possibly have uh, to know what is real and what's not real? Right. Uh, what's good, what's bad, because he could make us see or believe anything. And uh, that, that's really not, not uh, something that I think that a good God would allow to exist. Right. And it plays to you. It's not just knowing things that makes you intelligent, because you can know things that aren't true. And you can actually make things way more complicated or harder for you to live by. Look at the coronavirus situation that we have. How many people became experts in you know, biochemistry and, and viral infections overnight? You know, maybe after a couple of YouTube videos an hour are using that haphazardly. Dred, what do you got? Well, and, and that was the point I was going to make, actually, is, is intelligence is not about having access to information. It's about being able to evaluate the merit of that, of that information. So, you know, someone going on the Internet, they may have access to 10,000 sites that talk about uh, COVID and virology and all the rest of it. Mm. But, you know, the 
a higher intelligent, a more intelligent person would be able to, you know, sift through that uh, information to determine what is more likely to be the case and what is more likely not, and sort of be able to divide the wheat from the chaff. I really love that. Uh, George, what would, do you want to add? Would deductive reasoning be part of this mix? For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I think that plays a lot into like what SE is. It's just, you know, it benefits us to be able to do that. And all we're doing is trying to act like a coach where we encourage that kind of thinking in other people. I think critical thinking really plays a big part in intelligence. Like, can you use, sure. effectively use it to solve these problems <laughs> and improve your life and the lives of other people around you? Though we have this misnomer, I believe, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw this out. I believe that atheists have the impression that because you're religious, you're not as intelligent because you are uh, devoting a lot of your time and effort into something that we aren't convinced is true. And I feel like that could be a dangerous sort of assumption because one, I have a, from talking to people who are religious, I found that the smarter you are, the better you are convincing yourself that something is the case. Rationalizing, that's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> And I see it from like, you know, the people who are like way, way above me, college professors. I was just like, wow, wow. That's really impressive. My coworkers who I, I admire greatly have a God belief. And it's, it's, it almost startles me because I always assume that, oh, you must think like me. No, you, you believe in a God and you know, the periodic table all the way to 104 elements. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Yeah, you know what? I, w I just had <laughs> surgery last week. That's why I'm wearing this thing. Mm -hmm. And um, my surgery was done in a Baptist hospital. This oh. is the second time I've had surgery in a Baptist hospital. And I'm thinking, but I thought the Baptists don't believe in science. Hmm. So, so, yeah, it's hard to say you believe in science and not evolution here? at the same time, too. Yes. And there's it's just, real... it's just the science that contradicts the beliefs. I mean, the rest of the science is okay. <laughs> the rest right. of the science yeah. is okay. It's the cherry, it's the cherry they pick science. Yeah, they, don't, they don't have right. a problem with the science of, of germs, you know, the, the right. germ theory of disease or the gravitational theory or any other, the other thing. It's yeah. the evolution theory. It's the oh, creation. When it applies to Big human Bang beings. Theory. Yeah, when it applies to human beings, mm -hmm. unless yeah. if it's a way to make medicine or vaccines, then in right. which case they'll be like, you know, I'll just take the vaccine, but this has nothing to do with evolutionary problems. Yeah. Like, yeah. of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, we don't like that. We obviously see cherry picking. We see, you know, like a lot of egocentrism in there, but it, but it's not necessarily a mark of someone not being intelligent. I can say this as a person who was Christian myself. Like, I, I didn't feel any smarter when I lost my religion. I just felt like right. I had a door open that I walk through and I'm like, Oh man, there's this whole other room in my house. I've never been to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got to decorate again. I know it's so big. It's like, Oh, but it's empty. It's so empty. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with all this stuff? Right. I, I was way more comfortable back there. And I try to turn around and go back and it's locked. And you're like, well, I can't go back in there anymore. So I guess I'm stuck here in this big empty room now. So like, that's how it felt for me. So if anything, it felt like I lost stuff, but it yeah. did give me the opportunity to like, resettle redecorate and i feel like that's really important um, um I, if i may I, I yeah. just one thing you had uh, you know pointed out and something i read in a recent daniel dennett book is uh we're, we're all we're all subject to uh dunning kruger uh yeah. syndrome in some aspects of our lives can you so, explain that a second you know, oh, yeah, so I, yeah i was going to explain that and so the dunning kruger effect is uh the um, the 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 idea that uh, you can overestimate your confidence in a subject uh, with which you become acquainted, uh, for instance, internet people becoming sudden suddenly becoming virologists and bacteriologists uh, in uh, post COVID, um, mm -hmm. but uh, you know yeah. that, that, that can certainly be the case for everyone. I've been uh, you know I've suffered that syndrome in some respects in the past uh, mm. with some things I assumed to know a lot about and then uh, found out subsequently that I was absolutely way off base. Sure. Same you know? here. So we're all subject to that, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, just to throw something out, do we, I, I became an atheist as I was going through college, but it's not 
that becoming an atheist that gave me the college education. It's it's the fact that I still you know went through all the process of studying and working hard and taking on the tests. I don't feel any. I don't think I. I'll just put it this point again. I'm not saying uh, atheism made me any smarter, but I have seen the trend that typically people who are religious who go through a collegiate experience end on the atheist label. And I that's did. only because you get you get critical thinking shuck into you yeah. <laughs> to the point where it's like I can't I can't hold these two conflating or uh, uh, competing beliefs anymore. I have to go to the more reliable right. one. And I'm stuck and that's here. and that's where the cognitive dissonance uh, steps in and mm. and either you you figure it out or or you just walk blindly through right or you're a ticking time bomb for someone, someone else <laughs> uh, just go on mingle.com christianmingle.com you know, everything will be okay. <laughs> Uh, that says a lot about mental compartmentalization. It does. For sure. And yeah. it probably goes back to you, the, what George was alluding to before. Like there's different intelligences. Maybe there's like a religious intelligence versus like a reality intelligence, maybe. Just like, hey. Well, I was just thinking about more pedestrian sorts of things, you know. Like, um, you know, a long, long time ago, I was – being t given the army physical exam okay you know f to send me off to vietnam and get my brains turned into mush and um there was one part of that exam which was really well put together it was an intelligence test that assumed that you couldn't read hmm. Hmm. and it was a bunch of questions posed to the applicant in pictures and it was actually designed to test your mechanical intelligence and i thought wow how come nobody ever put this to me in college you know mm. i've got two college degrees and nobody's ever come th from that angle before i've never heard of it mm. yeah it's, it's i don't think we can like blame someone for being ignorant as a lack of intelligence like i don't think those are applicable i would that's like to correct this out. red leader you know a lot of magic tricks right like you've written an entire book called how jesus did it about like how magicians today could have done what jesus did with his technology even back then if he actually did it i'm wondering like from your impression is an audience that sees a magic trick and believes what the the magician is telling them less intelligent or any way incapable of intelligence? Did they do something dumb? Not less intelligent. James Randi said that, uh, oh, this is James Randi. Oh, I thought that was an <laughs> orc. I thought that was an orc from Skyrim in the background. But okay, now I got it. <laughs> no, one of the things James Randi said was that it's, uh, one comment he made was that it is more difficult to, uh, fool or impress a child with a magic trick mm. and mm. and being is because as a magician he plays on your assumptions well in our daily life we assume all kinds of things in order to do go out the throughout the day a little bit more efficiently we don't have to rethink everything all the time so he uses those assumptions i like that yeah and, yeah, yeah. Makes and, sense. And kids are way at more of one, a blank slate. At one point, I was working for a guy that was, uh, he, he had a magic shop, and uh, they were wanting some props created. One that I was, was looking at that fit the plans of was a stocks. The person would be in the stocks, and you would think, oh, he can't get out of that. But where the metal went, it looked like braces, that was actually a cut. It actually came up. But you looking at it, you assume that that's a, a straight, solid P. Or you make all kinds of assumptions. Children don't tend to make assumptions until much later. Yeah. And assumptions, the, one of the hard things about it is they're hard to give up. And they can actually interfere with your ability to solve problems, which goes back to Absolutely. what we're saying right. about intelligence. Yeah. In fact, there's a thing called, and I was talking to Tracy Harris about this, actually. It was interesting because um, uh, there's a thing called Occam's Razor, which, which has 
I'll explain what it is as part of this quote thing. But like uh, people believe Occam's razor is the simplest answer is the most correct answer. And that's not true. That's not what the, 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 the rule of Occam's razor is. Occam's razor is the, the answer that makes the least number of assumptions is often the right answer. And yeah. there's like some asterisks there, but it's about assuming that you're right. And we run into a situation where it's very easy to make rash judgments based on how simple the answer is, but it's very easy to come up with simple lies. And, mm -hmm. you know, and some lies or even some statements offer a lot more questions that we just aren't really to think about. Like, for example, God did it. You don't have to worry about like this whole rain condensation thing. It's like, no, God did it. That's the simplest answer. Occam's razor, that's the answer. It's like, you don't realize how many additional questions you just brought up to the table oh, when course. you say something like that. Larry, I, I think your, your audio went out, but it sounds like you have something so, you want to say. All right, Gary, go for it. I was just going to say that. that um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Go for it, that, go for it, Larry. That God raises about a thousand more questions than it answers, mm -hmm. like where it came from, and did he have a family, a parents, yeah. you know, uh, uh, just all kinds of things that you just assume that, yeah. that, that there are answers for when there really aren't. Right. Anyway, we're at the bottom of the hour. We probably need to take a break. Yeah. Uh, this is Digital Free Thought Radio Hour, WOZO Radio, 103.9 LPFM, right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We'll be right back after this break. 103.9 FM, WOZO Radio, Knoxville. Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Hello, and welcome back to the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour and WOZO Radio, 103.9 LPFM, right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Today's July 19th, and uh, this, we're going to talk about free thought groups that you can join right here in Knoxville. First, there's the Atheist Society of Knoxville. ASK was founded in 2002. We're in our 18th year. We have over 1,000 members, and you can find us online by searching for Knoxville Atheists or go to knoxvilleatheist.org. By the way, if you don't live in Knoxville, you can still go to Meetup and search for an atheist group in your town. Don't have one? Start one. one. <laughs> uh, also, there's the uh, Rationalists of East Tennessee. RET is another large free thinking group here in Knoxville, and you can find them at rationalist.org. Click on upcoming events to find out more about them. Earlier in the show, we said we'd talk about the Knoxville Atheist Call in TV show. Well, it's on YouTube. Just search for Free Thinkers United coalition of knoxville and you'll find their streaming version of a tv show and their their archives as well you can also search for free thought forum knoxville. not to interrupt but i sound a little confused it sounded like you, you said we had a tv show that's kind of cool we should talk about that more i'll bring it up next time yeah <laughs> next show we'll talk about it <laughs> that would be great yeah that's not a and thing you, you should let under the radar i'm actually serious we'll probably, yeah, we, we want to let people know yeah, you and if you're interested secrets, in getting involved in the TV or this radio <laughs> show, come to an Ask meeting, meet us online, go to uh, Ask an Atheist, no, what is it, uh, Knoxville Atheist <laughs> on Facebook, Atheist Society of Knoxville on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, Lots yeah. Lots of different ways. Sure. Uh, and on the show with us today, we have our co-host, Wombat. Hey! We also have... Um, Red Rider, George, and Red Pirate Higgs. So we were talking about intelligence. Where did we leave off? Sure, we were talking. Oh no, guys, guys. I don't know where I keep putting this. Dred, do you know oh. where it is? Um, no, there was a question. <laughs> Has anybody I, had a supernatural experience? No, there's something, I had something and I can't find it. And we have to, where is the love? The love. Where is the love? love? The love. The love. The love. The love. Oh, I, I, love. Like um, Let's I go would like one. to make an announcement. Uh, you can do it right after we handle this listener feedback question. Uh, we got a really great uh, message from Brandon. He said, um, hey, I'm a huge fan of the Let's Chat podcast ever since it popped up on my radar. Uh, you guys are awesome. And he wanted to ask a question about SE. SE, of course, being a way to talk to anyone about anything without triggering like emotions or ego and stuff like that. It's a great wow. way for two people to work together to figure out if someone reached their conclusion in a reliable way. And he wants to use SE as a way to talk people out of racist ideologies. And he thought it could be really useful right now. And I thought, wow, that's very powerful. Dred, I'm going to throw this out to you. What's SE? 
I just explained it, George. Anyone else re just hit J on your keyboard and you'll restart 10 <laughs> seconds back. Dread Pirate Higgs, uh, yeah. what is, do you think SE is a good way to deal with someone who has racist ideologies? I think so, because it helps that person sort of unpack how they came to um, formulate that, that particular ideology. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to really just help people, you know, uh, reflect uh, more upon themselves and how they got there as opposed to, um, you know, s sitting on the end beliefs without sometimes even knowing how they got there. Sure. Absolutely. I, and I love that answer. I also would just add, um, if you go into the belief thinking, I'm going to change this guy's mind because he's a racist and I'm not a racist. That's the wrong right. mindset for SE. Absolutely. You aren't there to try to change someone's mind. You try to figure out how they arrived at their conclusions. And if you work with them and you reach a dead end, that says way more than you saying, oh, well, you're wrong because of X, Y, Z. It's like, no, I was working with you and we can't, and we can't work together to, between the two of us to get to this conclusion. So yeah. maybe there's and, a and if way. you're really sticking to the Socratic examination as the methodology for street epistemology, mm -hmm. uh, that produces pretty fruitful results. Cool. Brandon, thank you so much for that feedback. Anyone else who has more feedback, feel free to leave a comment or email us. Uh, email us. Uh, we'll, be, we'll supply all of our contact information at the end of the show. Uh, Dale, you... Or, or Dale, uh, Dread, you got your hand up. What do you? I, got? I just, I just wanted to mention because you had brought up Occam's razor. Ah, uh, go for it. Um, go for it. Yeah. So, have you heard about Hitchens' ra Hitchens' razor? No. Throw it at me. <laughs> that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. I did. That it. was Christopher Hitchens. I dig it. Thank you for that. <laughs> That's <laughs> that is a useful thing to, to know. <laughs> yeah, okay. I believe Dale been trying to say something. Dale, what yeah. were you gonna? So I do. had an announcement a few minutes ago. It's probably too late for it now. Please. But uh, there are atheists who really can sing. Who can sing? Can think. Who can sing. Oh. Sing? Oh. Sing? Like sing? Like back when we were singing. Well, oh, I'm saying. one of them. <laughs> I'm one of them. In fact, I'm probably going to play one of my songs in the mid-show break. <laughs> <laughs> We have, we actually have a live stream, uh, someone following us on the live stream mm. who makes a comment, if I may, Go he says, it. when I use SE on people, they always feel challenged and quickly back out. Is yeah. there any, yes. uh, anything oh, you can recommend up. there? Go ahead. I think SE is just a way to ask a question, but it's one tool in a box of tools to have a good conversation with somebody. And one of the mo one of all of the more important tools uh, compared to SE are is, are you being personable? Are you comfortable? Do you understand body language? Do you understand how to have a conversation with people that's enjoyable? Like, are you friendly? Like there's a lot of things you have to work on other than just asking the proper SE question in order to facilitate a good conversation with someone. And my recommendation to get better at that is to do SE on topics that aren't particularly charged su subjects be like hey what's your favorite marvel movie well yeah Try to well, get that's, a that's yeah. the problem what yeah. i was going to say was that uh it depends on if the person came to your table willing to talk or if you're that's using it. se like on a, on a plane where you're just talking to the person next to you yeah. if you broach a subject that they're afraid to go into mm. they're they're not they're going to not feel comfortable they're going to shy away from it and they actually may have actual fear of that of broaching that subject and searching into it Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and you might ask your, your streaming uh, person uh, more details about it. Yeah. Uh, Gary, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? That's a great question, by the way. Thank you for that. He, uh, well, he just says he, he thinks it's also a cultural thing. There may be there's a cultural element there. So maybe he's working across cultures. I, I'm not sure, but yeah. it seems and, that way. And it's not something that what works good for Anthony Magnabosco. Well, wouldn't work well for me. Wouldn't work well for Reed. We all have to develop our styles based on the culture that we're in. And even Larry's got his own style. Like he mixes, you know, yeah. standard argumentation with some SE. So mm -hmm. he'll argue with you and then he'll throw some brainers at you. And you're like, oh, why is he asking me these deep <laughs> questions? I thought he wanted me to get angry. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. And, and same here. I, I don't do uh, the same style as Anthony or as, uh, as even Wombat. Me. Um, yeah. I think it's all about flavor and, and finding uh, the fit that works for you. Right. right. I think the most important thing when you're doing SE, number one rule, keep it positive, right? And then if you can, 
being comfortable in your own skin while you're talking to people is a big part of keeping right. it positive. Make it a yeah. conversation, not an, try not to make it an not argument. Not a confrontation. Not a confrontation. Oh, I'm going to steal that. That's so good. You heard it here first. I'm taking that. And then the last thing is let them do the thinking, right? Like you're not there right. to guide them to the conclusion. You're there to follow them to it and see if you can get there together. That's the most important part. All right. So uh, we had a really great question from Dale before we broke off to the end. It was... Oh, Dale, do you want to say the question? Do you remember it? Yes. Go for it. Uh, have any of you ever had a supernatural experience or something that you thought was a supernatural experience? Maybe somebody close to you has had a supernatural experience. Cool. Larry, I'll throw this yes. up to you first. I'll throw no. it up to Larry first. No for Larry. No. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to be interested in George's answer, but Dread Pirate, have you ever had a supernatural experience? Uh, at the time I might have thought it was, uh, but you know, over the years, uh, I've subsequently come to realize that, uh, it was a lot of my own wishful thinking that was sure. infused in that. And I'll just throw out my quick answer. Uh, it kind of goes back to what red leader was saying as a kid, you're it's, it's sometimes easier to, you have, you start off with more of a blank slate. Whereas an adult, you, you feed yourself with more assumptions, some valid, some not. But mm -hmm. when I was a kid, I could definitely say that I felt like I had a supernatural experience, but that was only because I had no standard for what supernatural was. And now that I'm an adult, <clears throat> I recognize that I have no basis to say what is supernatural versus what's not. I don't have a supernatural measuring stick. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I don't, I don't know. And I'm probably convinced that I, I'm more convinced of the natural experiences that I've had because I have no way of knowing if I had a supernatural experience or not. Right. So I'm not convinced that I've had any. George, what do you got? Well, I had a supernatural experience uh, a number of years ago in a class about such things. And um, I also have a scientific explanation for that That's supernatural it. experience. That sounds conflicting to me. What do you mean by supernatural, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Definition? <laughs> What well, is super, a super, supernatural? What is simply, supernatural? What's supernatural? Okay, it would an experience not defined by that it. would seem to defy science. Oh well, that could be anything. I, then, if that's the case, then yeah, I had some ice cream that was strawberry that tasted like cherry, and I'm like, this is supernatural. <laughs> <laughs> and don't you hate it? Well, you can put it. Okay, you, you you can put on it anything you want, but I'm saying yeah. this is. <laughs> This is where I'm coming from. <clears throat> you were it's, surprised um, based on the expectation that you had before. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, uh, that um, let's say based upon what most people would consider their own scientific knowledge, it doesn't make sense. Mm. The uh, the okay, I won't go into the the whole story because it's going to take five minutes. If you want to hear it, I'll no. tell you. It'll take five minutes. <laughs> yeah, we can do okay. it after the show for sure. Okay, but however. Uh, it, it was a phenomenon that is called psychometry in which an experience is recorded in an object to be played back by somebody else. Cool. Experienced by somebody else. This happened. Cool. Okay. Larry, um, what you, well, all it, I want to say it. is a lot of this supernatural uh, experiences that people have uh, come down to interpretation. Yeah. Uh, I know people that if they have a cold breeze, if they sit in their house and they get a chill or a cold um, air coming by, well, that's because a ghost went by. You know, it's an it's, ah. an, inter, it's an area of interpretation that yeah. they just say, oh, that's that couldn't be natural, so it's got to be supernatural. Yeah. Now, well, since, in the case of... Go ahead. In the case of, um, let's say, what I have d described here that was called psychometry, or I'll call it telepathy, um, I have a scientific explanation for this, for the possibility that makes sense to me, because mm -hmm. I have experience with radio. I understand how radio works. I understand the physics of it. And at least in my own mind, I have put together 
a rationale for how this could have happened in the scientific realm. I, I have an experience that I can't explain scientifically because sometimes I just become a goldfish and I don't understand how it's possible <laughs> for someone to become a goldfish. That's super and then natural. go right back to it. Yeah, I know. There's no explanation. I have a scientific explanation for it. But, it, you know, it's just supernatural. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. What it is. Uh, Dale, one thing I, yeah, you were going to ask Dale? <laughs> yeah, I want to go, yeah. Dale, have you had a supernatural experience? And would you like to talk about that? One time I was without sleep for four days, and I saw an elf. That's not good. That's so bad. Duck down behind a bolt of cloth. And I kept telling myself, there's no such thing as an elf behind that cloth. But no matter how much I could tell myself that, I could not stop myself from walking around the bolt and taking a real good look. Mm -hmm. Also, a spaceship once landed in the field behind my house. I'm more inclined to believe in spaceships than supernatural. Right. That's not supernatural. We have right. spaceships. <laughs> <laughs> those aren't those aren't supernatural things. Like we, I'm so upset that we don't go to the moon more frequently. But like mm. spaceships, we have them. That we yeah. can make well, them. It's not that surprising anymore. No, let me tell you what happened. What happened was is my dad was going to sleep, and he happened to glance out the window, and there was that spaceship. Now we're talking about the spaceship from the 19. 50s, you know, the mm -hmm. fins on the bottom and it's pointed, you know, like that. Yeah. And uh, he tried to go to sleep. He was thinking, he explained, he said, well, if the aliens are going to come and get me, there's not a whole lot I can do about it. I'm just going back to bed. And then he thought, no, I like that attitude. I have to have, <laughs> I have, to have somebody else see this. So he woke me up and I looked out the back window and there was a glowing spaceship about 50, 100 dubs. 50, 70 feet tall in, in the field behind our house. And I said, let's go look at it. And he said, no, you're not going anywhere. You're staying right here. But I got my binoculars and I looked at the spaceship. Come to find out that what it was was a tree, was a pine tree. And it was such a distance away that it looked exactly like a spaceship. But there had been a myth, a, a dew. And in our basement, we had a, a, a bulb, a light bulb that did not have the, uh, the uh, frosting on it. It was one of those naked bulbs, mm -hmm. it was clear. Yeah. It was shining out of the basement, hitting that tree. And then nice. just, like the, just like the signs on the road, you know, that have the little beads, it reflected that light directly back at it. But if I had not gotten those binoculars, I would swear to this day that a spaceship had landed in the field behind my house. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. There's a lot of things that we can't go back in time to verify. So when we have these impressions of things that are just memory, yeah, it, it's just this weird thing. Larry. Yeah, there, there was one thing that happened to me. Uh, it, like Dale's father, I was going to sleep. Mm -hmm. I turned off the light and I was going to sleep. And I hear this big explosion. It was like the uh, hot water heater blew up or something. And I turned on the, I sat up, turned on the light, and I looked down at the dog that was laying next to the bed. And he looked up at me and like, <laughs> what's up, boss? I love it when dogs do that. They're like, yeah, yeah, I don't I was, know well, that, that, that was just my imagination. It was mm. an audio hallucination. So I, I turned off the light and went back to bed. But if I didn't have a dog there, right, 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 and I right, went right. throughout the entire house and never saw any problem, then I would, you know, was that supernatural? Was that a ghost? You know, that kind of stuff. But it immediately uh, put it in the realm of uh, hallucination. I'm going to throw this out. Um, I don't think, I think Red Leader and Larry are, ex are a, are exemplifying what it means to be intelligent where it is we've had this issue where we couldn't explain something we had a problem and we did maybe some basic or maybe we did some investigation maybe we, our dog looked at us <laughs> maybe we got mm -hmm. maybe we did some work and looked at some binoculars and tr try to look how lights refracted and try to understand what we had seen in the past and try to make sense of it and we came out with a rationale that is way less based on assumptions like outcomes razor and came out with a better understanding of how reality works maybe learning some things in the process and i'm like that is what intelligence is to me like those are very intelligent mm -hmm. uh results to to arrive at and there are some people who don't do that <laughs> yes, was, yeah, that's, that's very clear yeah 
yeah i think i was thinking back about this radio show host larry let me know if you remember this guy uh he was a radio show entrepreneur he had a lot of channels a lot of tv shows and he said the world was going to end he was like this very famous pastor you remember what that guy's last name was um i don't he, had, he was a doomsday pastor he spent more money on any single event than any other oh. human being yeah i know who it is I, okay I can't yeah. think of his name but you'll, yeah, you'll, you'll it get was it. about three, four years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he said the world is going to end sometime in August, I believe. And uh, his followers believed him. You know, they, they right. looked at him as well, an authority. They, they sold all of their possessions and put the money in the bank, went to him and all congregated, gave him his money, yep. their, their money, for yep. whatever reason I can't imagine. To buy posters spread, and stuff like spread that. spread the yeah. word. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And it, and. That said, didn't said the word. Hey, don't spoilers. No spoilers yet. <laughs> uh, we uh, they said the world's going to end at six o'clock. They all go to New York, or one of them goes to New York. He said he sp- spent his entire life savings, like Larry said, and he's standing there in Times Square with a sign saying, "This is your last chance to repent." Everyone's around him and just being like, "It's not going to happen, dude. It's not going to happen." He's like, "I'm confident." He's he's interviewing with the news. Five fifty nine happens. Six o'clock happens. Nothing happens. 601, 602, and he just has the most confused expression. Still a Christian to this mm-hmm. day. Still yeah. very much a believer. But like that is a person, that is an example of a person who can't take those experiences and overcome his assumptions. Like mm-hmm. he can't be like, hey, that's a spaceship. No, it's not. Well, it's still a spaceship in my head. Like I feel like that's the lack, that's the lack of intellectual honesty, maybe if we're talking about different layers of intelligence, that yeah. um we're, we're seeing there. And I think intellectual honesty plays such a big part in intelligence in general. Um, Dread Pirate, I want to go to you. Have you ever had a supernatural experience? Maybe we, we, you, you said no, but like, have you ever had an experience now that we're defining it more of like a mis- misinterpretation of something in the past that you really oh, sure. at Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, the, the idea that I may have seen ghost or, mm. you know, that, that sort of thing. And yeah, I mean, that, that sort of thing was much more frequent when, Certainly, when I was, a, you know, a much more religious person, uh, and for uh, you know a few years, I dabbled in the occult and you know actively tried to practice magic and you know bring up spirits and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and yeah, I, I fooled myself quite a bit, um, mm. thinking that I was getting somewhere with it, but uh, ultimately, it was just I was just fooling myself. So. Anything spectacular? I feel like you're walking around some pretty awesome stories. <laughs> well, probably a lot longer than we've got the four minutes for. <laughs> <laughs> I, remember, I, may, I may bring something up at a later time. I remember when I was in like first grade, I was riding like the, the tricycles that they gave out to kids. And I was going to ram, ram straight into the kid in front of me because I, could, I couldn't stop fast enough. And I shut my eyes. And the next time over to my eyes... I was on the other side of the kid still going at just as fast. So like either in my head, I thought, Oh, I went through the kid and just physics. Uh, worked out for a while. Right, that worked right. out for me. Yeah. But in my looking back now, it's like, maybe the kid got out of the way. Maybe I was just swerving out of the way just through my nerves. But like in my head, I've kept that with me for like maybe 17 years of just like, Hey, proof wow. of God, I was on to like better things. Cause I could have died then I could have had something happen to me then, but it didn't happen. Therefore God, I needed that. I needed that to like hold up this mm-hmm. crux. That's how, that's how strenuous people hold, you know, their faith basically just on these like misinterpreted circumstances but hey you want oh now now we're going to pull out the big guns speaking of things people misinterpret as the past like the bible (laughs) in a sense is basically just a chronicle of misinterpreted points of view and i think who better to talk about you know misinterpreting things in the bible than how jesus did it red leader is there anything in the bible that may be misinterpreted is that even possible well, uh, when you're talking about supernatural experiences, there's these coincidences that people have happened where you think of somebody and the phone rings and you pick it up, it's them. Well, I had an odd one with the Bible. I was writing a section of my book about circumcision, about using circumcised penises as a weapon of mass destruction that's in the Bible. <laughs> well, it's in the Bible. It's in there. It's in there. Anyway, so I'm sitting there writing of writing this part about how you know they did this, and and they 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 
It was a weapon of mass destruction. But anyway, <laughs> while the TV was on, it was uh, it was it was one of those Terminator shows. But anyway, okay. the, the Terminator girl starts talking about the exact uh, verse of the Bible that I was looking at. Right. Now, the chances have got to be a bazillion to one that while I'm writing on it, this girl comes on and starts talking about circumcised penises as weapons of mass destruction. Sure. So, but, you know, it, it, I, as a deist, I'm not allowed to think in supernatural terms. But isn't that just incredibly, it, I found it to be incredibly coincidental. Yeah, coincidence I mean, this is happening. a really obscure, obscure part of the Bible. What? You know, coincidences do happen. I mean, Plus, if you weren't writing, writing on that book, I mean, you still would have seen it yeah. and you wouldn't have thought anything about it. And but, what'd you say, one in a billion? And then there's like, what, seven I don't know. million I people don't on earth, think, lots of people writing books? So many- Seems like there are so many stories in the Bible just for that one to come up on, on this this girl. Do you have a chapter and verse on that? But the, about the <laughs> Do you have a chapter and verse on that? Yeah. Uh, you, can, you can give it at the end of the show. Um, I would I would like yeah. to throw out one last pick. Uh, this is um, picking on the idea of how can we measure intelligence. There's this idea that if you have an IQ number. That represents how intelligent you are, and they and the means of how they test IQ is is different based on you know there's not even like a a, a major organization that assesses it, but um, I was talking about this with Dread Pirate, uh, the uh, the concept of intelligence quotient or quotient or however you want to pronounce that it should be quotient uh, refers to it's your intelligence based on your local population, it's not. And IQ is never taken globally, like where you're competing against like people from China or India and stuff like that. It's typically around the people who've taken the test who are in your your near immediate area. And if that's the case, if you are if you if you're in a place and a bunch of smart people move in, <laughs> your IQ goes down, even though mm-hmm. you haven't changed at all. Whereas if you move to a place where there's not as many smart people, or maybe you're the, one of the only people, maybe your IQ jumps up a bit because you're now you know, at average or at least beating the average. So, yeah, uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know how you came up with that, that profile. Um, so I, I am a member of Mensa. Cool. Uh, in fact, I'm a, a local secretary and proctor for Mountain Mensa here in Western Canada. Um, and the, the test again, you know, we, we were talking earlier about, you know, defining what intelligence was and it's, it's not about who you know. It's not the cultural milieu in which you exist. It is broader. It's it's based on your capacity and ability to solve problems, uh, based on the available information, and uh, the Wonderlic tests, which are used now, sort of as the the standard uh, for Mensa. There are different kinds of uh, int- intelligence tests, right? Like LSATs, and I mean, all the SATs are, are essentially aptitude tests that measure to some degree intelligence. Um, and so these cross the borders of language, uh, of mathematical acumen, of uh, all kinds of these things that, uh, you know, might be a benefit to people who have a college education, for instance. Um, they they do um, they do uh, you know suss out uh, intelligence on a much more fundamental level, and so that would be the that would be my contention is that it, there is a valid way of uh, determining relative uh, intelligence through uh, IQ. I would I would and I thank you for that. I would always wonder: is there a better way of measuring intelligence than measuring iq and 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 reducing it down to a number because i look at things like the wonder lake and we have it, we have thing called nfl here in america I, i'm sorry in usa i know canada sorry about that you guys have american football too or canadian football too <laughs> uh but you do the wonder lake as part of your assessment to determine how good of a football player you will be and that test is available to you right now if you're watching this you can take the wonder lake test right now and it's what it is is a bunch of basically basic high school level 
um, assessment questions that you tr only have like 12 minutes to answer, but you have like 100 questions. So it's more of a question of how much you can answer in a short period of time. And you're supposed to skip answers that you might take too long on because your score is going to be based on the average of everybody else who also did the test. So it doesn't actually have to be perfect, just going to be assessed on that average. I did that. I did that test on multiple times, each time getting slightly higher than before. But I'm, I noticed that it's more of a gimmick of what I'm, I'm about to anticipate and being able to regurgitate that thinking process appropriately to like get us to squeak my way towards a higher score. And I wonder like if I can, if I can eke my score by like 30% higher by multiple taking of the test, am I really measuring my intelligence or just my ability to do well on this test? Or the ability to learn how to take tests. Uh, that too. To take and tests. I mean, and if I, you're doing the same test over and over again. No, no, no it's different questions. It's different questions. I know. And I wonder like, is if that's the case, isn't, isn't, isn't there a possibility that people with really high IQ levels are just people who've taken the test a lot of times and are really good at taking IQ tests. Mm. I feel the same yeah. way applies to SATs as well. I, I did really well on my SATs, but absolutely fundamentally more when I was in college and realized how much I didn't know and how to work with people and do research and figure out what's good information from bad information. Like that's SAT. You couldn't put my college experience in a piece of paper that I have to answer with multiple choices. Like there's just, there's no, I don't know if there's a compatibility. I'm fine with Mensa. I'm fine with IQ. I wish there was a better acceptable way to measure intelligence than those men. Mm -hmm. wow. Well, you know, one thing I should note about uh, the, the Mensa IQ test anyway, is that they're evaluated by psychologists um, and the way they're evaluated. So, I mean, you made the point that uh, you could skip questions or you can make guesses. So it's not like they just, you know, stick the template over the, uh, over the answer sheet and, and mark off the ones where the holes align with the answers, right? Mm. Um, answers are often, I mean, they're, they're evaluated within the context of other questions. So like some psych, psychology tests uh, where, you know, you're asked the same question in various different ways uh, to uh, get around you get around a person, you know, trying to uh, game the test as it were. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so these IQ tests, especially the wonder like are done in the same way so that it's, you know, it's, it's a hard one to, to actually practice. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I hear you. It's, and it's evaluated. Know. It's evaluated on a, on a broader, on a, you know, sort of in a broader fashion than just, sticking the template over and, and chucking the, sure. the ones you got right into the hole. So I'm at least relieved that there's efforts to make it better, but maybe yeah, I imagine there might be. Yeah. Uh, Dred, where can we find your stuff at? Uh, well, we're streaming live uh, on my YouTube channel, mind pirate P Y R A T E. And um, we do that on Sundays at eight o'clock to nine o'clock. Cool. In the morning. Uh, and George, I know you probably don't have anything. That's totally fine. But hey, is there a website you would recommend, Red Leader, <laughs> we should check out? Yeah, Larry asked me for the for the uh, scripture verse. verse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about the weapon of mass destruction. Uh, I believe, Larry, if you look in the book, it's either under the joy of circumcision or adventures, more okay. adventures in circumcision. Your book. And there, mm -hmm. there will be a reference to be And what's the name of your book? Yeah. <laughs> now you can find it at uh, howjesusdidit.com. Right. That's how Jesus did it. com. Yeah. Now, Dale, you're also a sculptor. Did you do the sculpture behind you? Yeah, good question. Yes. It's very yes, good. That's James Randi. I, yeah. met, I met him. Mm -hmm. Cool. Very cool. Yeah, uh, I did that. Find... Very nice. <laughs> yeah, it's very nice. You can find myself at Let's Chat. You're probably here right now. So thanks for watching this video. Yeah. Larry, I'm all good.
Okay. Uh, this has been digitalfreethought.com, uh, radio hour, sorry. Uh, you can find my book, uh, Atheism, What's It All About, on uh, Amazon. Uh, be sure, sure to check out our blog at digitalfreethought.com slash blog. Uh, for, and for our radio show archives, our atheist songs, and many articles on Facebook on the subject of atheism. If you have any questions for the show, you can send them to askanatheist at knoxvilleatheist.org. Uh, you can find our podcasts not only on digitalfreethought.com, but on iTunes and Stitcher and Luminary and podcast.com, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe and to be notified when new episodes are available. Also, I'd like to remind everybody at the end of the show that everybody is going to somebody else's hell. The time to worry about it is when they prove that heavens and hells and souls are real. Until then, don't sweat it. Enjoy your life. <laughs> and we'll see you next week, 7 o'clock on WZO Radio 103.9 LP FM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Say goodbye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.